Well, I'm afraid it's a bit long, this video. Now, can you please spend about three minutes talking to your partners? What have you seen in this video? What has caught your attention? And what is the connection between this and design thinking? Okay, may I have your attention, please? I'm very sorry to interrupt your lively conversations, but there are lots of things to do, so we have to move on. Okay, so what's, what's your impression? I'm very curious to know what the impressions are. What's going on on this video?
does anything happen at all in this video? What, what, what's going on? You've got a group of students, a group of kids in kindergarten, pre-primary education, and there's a teacher talking to, to them. And what are they analyzing? A butterfly, different versions of the same butterfly. What was the instructions that were given to the, the pupil that drew this butterfly? What was the instruction? He was asked to produce an accurate scientific depiction drawing of this butterfly. Is that something that you can expect your students to achieve straight away? No, you need to give them explicit training. Now, let's go back to the five phases of the design process. Which specific phase or stage can you see in this video? Is it prototyping or not? What do you think? Prototyping is coming up with different versions different solutions to the same problem. The problem was, I have to draw this butterfly as accurately as possible. So I'm going to produce different drafts, and I'm moving toward excellence. That's the point. That, to me, makes design thinking extremely powerful. The students are moving in the context of what I call a mastery framework. You want your students to reach excellence. I don't want my students to achieve just 70% reach 70% of the curriculum. I want them to get the full thing, okay? 100%. So as you can see, students start to think more as if they were scientists, that's the point. Now, try to think about Khalil. You want your students to become more and more perfect with the passing of time. And by perfect or perfection, I mean, you want your students to grasp content and you want them to express that content, both in writing and in speaking, with as much perfection as possible, accuracy and fluency, both of them. I'm trying to make connections between this and CLEAR, so, so that you can see that there's really a connection between design thinking and CLEAR. Well, actually what we see in this video is a teacher developing inquiring minds in class. Inquiring minds are minds that know which questions to ask and which pertinent comments to make. Did you notice the way the teacher interacted with the students? To me, they were extremely mature, very articulate in giving feedback to the teacher about the way the butterfly draft improves over time. So the draft, the first draft, has nothing to do whatsoever with the last draft becoming more and more perfect. That should be the philosophy guiding clear practice. We're moving towards excellence. And that's what I have summarized here as the huge pedagogical potential here in design thinking for a human-centered learning experiences that seek excellence. Design thinking is human-centered. You start with empathy. You start by understanding your users, your audience's needs, and you start looking for solutions. Okay? Well, in this video, you can see at least three different concepts, big, big clusters of concepts, which to me summarize the potential of design thinking in class. First, it's learner center. It's not a teacher-centered experience. It's not the teacher talking all the time students listening, taking notes, uh, filling the blanks, or matching, doing uh, mechanical activities that only activate lots, not hots. That's the problem. Your students need cognitively demanding tasks, challenges. And well, the same thing is learn essentially. You give your students a problem. It could be in the form of a project. It could be in the form of a problem and they have to look for solutions. It fosters cooperative learning. It takes into account multiple intelligences, the different learning styles, paces of your students, and is closely connected with task-based learning. You know the difference between exercise, activity, task, and project, don't you? Task is a sort of atom. A project is, well, when you put those atoms together, when you, when you put different tasks together, what you get is a project which is even more ambitious. 
But the interesting thing about this video is that the student, these students, these kids, pre-primary education pupils, are articulating their understanding. They're interacting with each other. They're interacting with the teacher, trying to make sense of an experience. Now, if you think about CLIL, you have to think of tasks and experiences that give your students opportunities to interact with each other, to verbalize their understanding. That's of the essence. If you don't give your students opportunities to express what they have understood, how else can you make sure that they are making progress, that they are moving towards the target that you want them to achieve? And as you can see, design thinking experiences, design thinking experiences give pupils opportunity to verbalize what they understand from the input that you give them. Interdisciplinarity. Design thinking, as we will see in the practical part of this workshop, encourages people to approach a problem from multiple perspectives or multiple angles. And actually designers, product designers, can form interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary teams, each one with their own expertise. And when they put those different kinds of expertise and talents together, they come up with wonderful solutions. Well, I don't have to tell you anything about key competences, but we do live in a key competence model, in a competence-based paradigm. And entrepreneurship is, has nothing to do with setting up a business, and Jose Luis referred to this this morning in his talk. Entrepreneurship is about taking agency over the learning process, making your own decisions, making mistakes, which might be productive mistakes that puts you towards excellence, and then creativity. In this video, you can also see how analytical and integrative thinking work. How they are putting problem-solving skills in, into practice. And well, ICT tools, you can use lots of ICT tools in your classroom in sort of design thinking inspired tasks to, to boost your students' creativity. Okay, so remember those are the five different stages of the design thinking process. And this is the implementation phase, which takes you back to the beginning to start looking for new solutions. Right? So first you understand your user, you understand your user's problem, you define, you frame or reframe the problem. You start look, coming up with different ideas, different solutions to that problem. You make a prototype, which is usually something visual, some, something made up of recycled material or anything you might want to use in your class with your students. Then you put it into practice, you test it, and you get feedback at the implementation stage, which takes you back to the beginning. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, so that's the only thing you have to remember about design thinking. Five stages that you can apply to any clear situation. Okay, and what's the connection between design thinking and code? Again, this is a very personal meditation. I've been thinking hard about the connection between design thinking and CLIL for quite a few months already. And these are my findings. This is what I've learned so far. I'm still making progress. So first, you can apply the tools of design thinking to at least two big areas. One has to do with curriculum design and decision making in a bilingual school. That's what I call a vision of CLIL in your school. And the other area which is susceptible of being approached by means of design thinking is methodology, what happens in the classroom. So this has to do with the school as a, as a whole, as an institution, and this has to do with what happens in your classroom. Okay, so let's focus on this, rethinking CLIL settings. Design thinking allows us to explore alternative ways to approach clear implementation in schools. You've got to make decisions. To begin with, you need to decide which subjects you're going to teach through the L2. Isn't that one of the earliest decisions you have to make? Is it gonna be social sciences, natural sciences, physical education? It depends on the community but it's a decision that has to be made by the whole school. So it's sort of what I call 
the, the philosophy or the vision of CLIR in my school. There are certain preliminary decisions, basic decisions, which are fundamental to the whole process. And those have to be made collaboratively. But then when it comes to methodology, what happens? It's you as a teacher with your group of pupils in your class. And you've got to make lots of decisions. You want to foster cooperative learning? Are your students going to be, going to be grouped in groups of four or five heterogeneous groups? Are you really catering for students' needs and interests? Are you integrating content and language learning in creative and effective ways? Are you giving your students scaffolding, both linguistic and conceptual scaffolding, so that they understand difficult concepts in content subjects? Are you also instilling values such as solidarity, the importance of constancy and effort in your students? Are you practicing any of these design thinking strategies such as brainstorming, drafting, empathizing, even receiving relevant feedback. So lots of things that you can think about the way you teach your content subject. So if you, if you look at this again, this slide, it sort of summarizes the two big areas where you can do something as a school, as a teacher. Any questions so far? I'm going to give you a set of photocopies for a practical session now because we have been looking at design thinking from a theoretical perspective. But I really want you to see the connection and the potential of design thinking for CLIR before you leave this room. So I'm going to give you a set of photocopies. They're going to be working in pairs from now on. But first, I need, you, I need to give you very precise instructions. So let me give you the photocopies first. Let me give you instructions. I'll give you time to work in pairs. And after, let's say, 40 minutes, no more, we're going to discuss the experience together as a whole class. Okay, is the timing clear to everyone? 40 minutes for pair work. And then we're going to discuss the implications of design thinking for CLIL in very practical terms. Okay? 